Hello, this is Matt, and I am back with Sonic Academy to look at the Arturia V Synclavier, or even Synclavier V, as uh, those crazy kids are calling it. Why are we looking at this one? Well, it's because life is too short not to look at this amazing machine. At the same time, life may not be long enough to look at this amazing machine. It is a bit fiddly. I am fond of telling you how we're going to go through this and we're going to come out the far end and it's all going to seem much simpler. Well, that is going to happen, but much simpler is a relative term. It's going to seem a lot simpler than it does currently. It's never going to feel as simple as an SH-101 or Behringer Moog. This is quite the complex beastie. On the other hand, it's quite a complex beastie. You can do some amazing things with it. So, what are those amazing things? What can we do? Well, it is an FM synthesizer to start with, kind of like DX7 Ableton operator kind of vibes. But it's not just an FM synthesizer, that would be too simple. Next thing is, it's also an additive synthesizer. If you've been following my series of Arturia V classic stuff, you'll have remembered we did the organs, we looked at sine wave drawbar stuff. Well, that's a kind of form of additive. So you can do that here, you can control individual harmonics and create your own waveforms. So rather than just having sawtooth, square, sine, triangle, you can basically draw, using harmonics, your own basic waveform. Okay, so you can start with an additive synth to make your waveforms. Then you feed those waveforms into a frequency modulation synthesizer to create yet more tones. That would be plenty, but on top of this, We've also got a form of wavetabling, which NED, uh, New England Digital and Arturia, refer to as timbre frames. It's not quite the same as a wavetable that you'd find in the Profit VS or the PPG Wave, but it's very similar in that you essentially set up a series of different waveform settings along a timeline, which you can then sweep around as the note is playing. So, to recap, you can create your own waveforms, you can then make a sequence of those waveforms in a kind of timeline that you can move between as you're playing each note and those complex evolving waveforms are also being fed into an FM synthesis setup. That's just one what they call a partial. You have 12 partials so a partial is kind of like an oscillator only it's much more complicated. It's everything I just mentioned going on is one partial You've got 12 of them stacked up. So that would be plenty. I've, I'm already kind of slightly reeling from trying to explain it in one mouthful. On top of that, it's also a sampler. It was one of the world's first commercially available samplers. Um, at the time, incredible groundbreaking technology, vastly expensive. On top of that, it's also a resynthesizer, which means that it can attempt to analyze a sample and then recreate it with its additive and FM synthesis capabilities. That's what we've got here. The Synclavier V is a beast. The real Synclavier did even more, so before I run out of breath and ability to even remember half the things this thing does, let's do a recap of the history of the Synclavier, how it came to be, some of the things that aren't in this version because uh, it just did so much that some of these things aren't really capable of being put inside a DAW, inside a plugin. So we'll quickly run through them to see an idea what the guys who were making this were thinking about, and then we'll start burning through the synth itself. So the origins of the Synclavier were a research project at Dartmouth College in the US. A composer called John Appleton worked with a couple of digital computer engineer sort of researchers, a guy called Sidney Alonso and one of his students, a guy called Cameron Jones. And the intention was to make a digital computer synthesizer, uh, which hadn't been done before, obviously. There'd been work into FM synthesis by uh, John Chowning, and that work had been signed up by Yamaha. So the guys at Dartmouth had to sort of license that back in. But what they were doing was something more advanced again, really, rather than just simply uh, having a synthesis technique, they wanted to build the hardware and the whole thing from scratch. Because this is 1972, when that sort of stuff is incredibly thin on the ground. So, the first step was to define what they were trying to do, and their biggest concern about analog gear was that it had a stable, fixed sonic waveform at core. So once you'd chosen your saw or square, it tended to just sit there and then you shaped it with filters and so on afterwards. For their ideal synthesizer, they would have more control at the actual waveform, so they would be shaping the, uh, the tone continuously throughout its playing time. 
So to this end, they created their own hardware, a computer system called ABLE Able, and around that came the first prototype of the Synclavier, the Dartmouth Digital Synthesizer, which even gave rise to its own spin-off album. The track on there by John Appleton is the first recording of what would become the Synclavier. In 1976, Sidney Alonso and Cameron Jones formed NED, New England Digital, and they began marketing the Synclavier. The Synclavier One was a computer rack system that you edited the sound and the, uh, the tune through a computer terminal called a VT-100, so it was very much like working at a computer monitor rather than playing an instrument. It was FM only in its first iteration, so it was the world's first commercially available digital FM synthesizer. It was followed in 1979 by the instrument that made Synclavier the must-have keyboard for the upper end of the market, the Synclavier 2. The Synclavier 2 brought additive synthesis into the technology. It also allowed for the first time the use of keyboards, one called the OFK that was a simple on-off trigger keyboard, and later followed by the VPK which was licensed from Sequential and their Prophet T8, so one of the famously best feeling keyboards ever made. And with this, it was more akin to actually playing an instrument, and the Synclavier 2 was adopted by a large number of very high-end musicians, recording studios and film studios. As well as the FM additive synthesis, the new Synclavier 2 brought in such new features as direct-to-disc sampling, 32-track sequencing before MIDI was available to other keyboards, and the increase in features was reflected again in an increase in price. A full-spec Synclavier 2 could run to half a million dollars. It was pretty much the only game in town other than the Australian Fairlight. So at a time where tapeless recording was a dream of the far future to most people, it became indispensable for certain hit makers of the 80s. The final models of the Synclavier were gigantic post-production digital workstations, primarily used again in the sort of film industry rather than music per se, really again due to the price tag and the slow increasing availability of this sort of technology at a cheaper level. People like Ensonic and Akai starting to make vastly, vastly more affordable instruments that did far, far less, but for most people, that was enough. With the rise of cheap computer studios, NED were obviously on borrowed time, and in 1992, the company finally closed. The various parts of it continued the uh, support of all the hardware. There's a couple of companies still running that. The intellectual property of the software and the actual kind of design of the instrument itself stayed with some of the original inventors. And so Synclavier, as an idea, is still being worked on. There was a, a Synclavier 3, which ported the software across to the Apple Mac so that you could continue to run the original NED hardware but via a modern computer interface. And this has come to its final obvious conclusion with a collaboration with Arturia, which has resulted in the Synclavier V. There are even mumbles on the, uh, the Synclavier website of another chapter coming in 2019. So the Synclavier is not just a dusty old instrument from the past, it's still developing and it's still part of the evolving musical landscape. So we're going to look at it now and see what we can do with it. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please, we'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.